So let's talk now about how the DoD moved to DevSecOps and embraced Kubernetes and Istio to move at the pace of relevance. This is a DoD case study to give you some insights on the return on investments and the benefits for the Department of Defense, the largest behemoth in the world, to move to DevSecOps and save a hundred year of time in one year by moving 27 of its programs, including weapon systems, space systems, jets, and bombers to DevSecOps. If they can do it, so can you. And check out our video on SpaceX versus F-35 as well. So how did the Department of Defense move to DevSecOps? Well, first we created a joint initiative with all of the DoD services, OSD, and really getting the buy-in from the leadership all the way at the top. But we also had a lot of great doers and teams excited to get things done from the bottom up. We created two enterprise services. The first one is Cloud One, which is a cloud office abstracting the cloud provider, bringing both Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, and Oracle. With a single cloud stack and a single abstracted layer, we're able to streamline the process when it comes to getting access to a cloud enclave and be able to help teams to be accredited and start deploying their technical stack and their mission software on the cloud as well. The second team we created as a second enterprise service was Platform One, which is a DevSecOps teams that can run a DevSecOps platform anywhere, whether it's on the jet, a bomber at the edge, on the classified cloud, on the commercial cloud, or completely air-gapped. Platform One is enabling teams to get started and streamline the adoption of DevSecOps very rapidly. We created enterprise managed services to be able to help teams get access to collaboration tools, cyber tools, and a development environment so they can effectively get started within minutes instead of often up to a year with a multiple million dollars spent per team to reinvent the wheel. By streamlining the process and creating an enterprise service, we're able to not only accelerate the adoption, but also really get access to the best talent to get the job done, emerge the work across teams to be able to be more efficient and be able to save a tremendous of taxpayer money as well. We also created the Iron Bank. The Iron Bank is effectively the DoD version of a Docker Hub, which is a repository of containers that are accredited, hardened, and designed to be uh, effectively meeting the DoD requirements to run on classified systems. The Iron Bank has about a thousand containers, both commercial uh, and also um, open source products as well. The DoD Enterprise DevSecOps initiative was redesigned to have a security baked in with zero trust down to the container level. We're going to show you how we got this done in a matter of really weeks when many organizations struggle to scale any kind of zero trust architecture uh, in more than you know, a couple of months as well. We also wanted to make sure we would streamline the adoption of AI and machine learning by being able to bring an MLOps stack on top of Kubernetes so that teams can effectively get access to the right tools to be able to train and adopt AI models at scale across their mission software. We had about 100,000 people to, to, to train. So you can imagine the complexity when it comes to being able to bring an unbiased curriculum so it's not pushing the secret sauce of a single company, whether it's a cloud provider or a Kubernetes distribution product. And so we had to really uh, partner with a lot of existing commercial content and also created some of customized uh, content that you see here to be able to uh, really streamline the self-learning aspect through a learning hub platform so that uh, these 100,000 people can not only have about an hour a day given to them to learn, but also be able to uh, first catch up and then keep up with the crazy pace of IT as well. Finally, we created the concept of a continuous authority to operate, which is moving from a snapshot in time in accreditation and compliance to a real-time dashboard visibility where teams are able to see exactly the ongoing risks and the technical debt and cyber technical debt when it comes to scanning and also uh, runtime security and so we'll show you in a dedicated segment 
how we created the continuous authorization model, uh, continuous ATO, to be able to continuously accredit software so it can be deployed in production multiple times a day as well. In 2019, the department started with a, what I wanted to be a very impactful first use case. So I see a lot of teams make the mistake to start to uh, bring DevSecOps uh, in an easy fashion and not focused on mission outcomes. I wanted to really pick a use case that would be hot enough so teams will really be surprised that we could get this done very quickly, but also bring a real benefit to the mission of the organization. And so we picked the F-16 jets uh, which, you know, the hardware is, is, is about 60, 50 years old. We did not update the hardware. It's using the legacy hardware. And we were able to take what used to be running C and ADA and deploy Kubernetes and Istio, the service mesh, to be able to now run Java, Python, and Go on the, on the legacy hardware with no impact to the ability to fly the jet. Uh, fast forward to 2020 and 2021, we're able to take this at scale across the, the Air Force and Space Force enterprise and Kubernetes and Istio became the default uh, to orchestrate software on our weapon systems. And so what you see here with a U2 jet uh, is the ability to first take that legacy uh, jet, which is 70 years old, be able to deploy the platform one DevSecOps stack that we call Big Bang and build AI ML containers that are replacing the human, the pilot, so the pilot doesn't have to manage the sensors of the, on the jet and instead can do something else. And so we're able to take that AI ML uh, container on the jet, decouple it with the flight control and airworthiness aspect of the aircraft and be able to deploy that on the jet in 12 days, fly the jet and be able to demonstrate we could receive over the update like a Tesla would do while flying the jet with no impact to the airworthiness of the aircraft. So that's really a game changer when it comes to orchestrating software, deploying software at, at scale, and with a velocity that matters when it comes to be able to compete against uh, China and Ru Russia, for example. So we decided to cut our stack in layers to be able to enable reuse and avoiding reinventing the wheel for every team. As you can imagine, the department has a uh, 4 million employees, a lot of different uh, programs across the enterprise between jets, bombers, ships, and space systems, and submarines, and so on. We wanted to be able to uh, reuse layers that are created layers uh, across the enterprise, so not every single team has to worry about that and, and get this done in vacuum. So we separated the infrastructure layer, that's why we created Cloud One, to be able to first decouple the on-premise cloud edge uh, accreditation so so that the software we build can then run across all of these different use cases. And so the, the first enabler was to accredit the cloud providers and the different um, orchestration stacks and, and uh, virtualization stack so we can be agnostic and, and then put Kubernetes uh, with Platform 1 on top. So Platform 1 brings multiple options when it comes to Kubernetes distributions on top, and then we bring on top of that a, a CI CD pipeline that's completely containerized like we talked about using the containers from Iron Bank that are already passing and, and meeting the duty hardening requirements. And so now teams can pick the best tool to get the job done. We have 16 programming languages, 23 databases, really streamlining the adoption of, of, of best of breed options. And now you have uh, a full CI CD pipeline, a full orchestration stack. The next step is to put the service mesh on top. And really, the service mesh is enabling uh, the um, cyber stack to be injected across the enterprise without having to coordinate uh, the, the, the sharing of bits across teams. And so the service mesh is able to enforce zero trust and do so without having to coordinate releases between all these different teams across DoD. So that's a massive enabler to decouple the, the cyber teams from the development teams. And then on top of that, you end up putting your mission software, which is also containerized and inherit all the hardening of all of these layers. And so effectively we realized that about 85 to 90% of the NIST 800-53 controls are met from the get-go. So teams can now focus on the Delta 
but then also spend more time, uh, you know, improving and building better capabilities instead of reinventing all the bottom layers to deploy their, their software. So you, you're massively accelerating their ability to deploy to production. And as you see on the left side here, we have the sidecar container security stack, and we have a whole video segment on sidecar container and the benefit there. But effectively, uh, the beauty is that we can inject the cyber stack to be agnostic to the mission software and make sure that we have the same enforcement, the same visibility and the same access to logging and telemetry and continuous monitoring benefits across the enterprise without having to uh, coordinate the release of software. So that uh, layered system is really enabling us to, um, to move fast and not have to reinvent the wheel for every single team across DoD. So as you can see here, we have so many teams and software factories and uh, partners across the department, other agencies, federal agencies, innovation labs, and commercial uh, partnerships. And to for us, having cloud and platform one as enterprise services to streamline the adoption of DevSecOps across all these teams was so essential to our success of, of achieving the velocity that we needed. And as you can see, uh, these teams are already across the enterprise. So uh, this is a massive uh, accelerator across across DoD. So now as you see on this map, you can uh, clearly see that uh, the implementation of Platform One is enabling teams across uh, the United States, of course, but also across missions, uh, including jets, bombers, space systems, even nuclear systems as well. So the ability to, to be agnostic to the environment and be able to take a piece of software and deploy it pretty much anywhere is kind of game changing for uh, kind of the Lego blocks aspect of reusing software across teams. So that's been a, a pretty exciting uh, benefit of moving to containerization uh, because now you have these Lego blocks that can be reused uh, across um, not only teams within the same uh, DoD service, but also across the Navy, Army, Air Force, uh, and, and Space Force and Marine Corps. So that's uh, that's a pretty massive ability to, uh, to reuse uh, uh, code. So as you can see here, we have all the different phases of the DevSecOps pipeline. And this is just an example of we have a thousand containers. So there's way more options, right? We talked about 23 databases and 16 programming languages and a lot of different logging and telemetry tools and cyber tools and, and build tools and test suites and so on. Uh, but, but what's important to understand is if you had to run these across every team, and, and if you look at some of the big programs like F35, we end up having not only uh, development, testing, staging, and production, but we also have um, effectively multiple classification levels. So you're, so you're, you're multiplying the number of environments you know, uh, across N-class, secret, secret salt, TS, TSSCI, TSL classification levels. So you end up having probably 20, 30, 40 of these environments running uh, just for one program. If you have to maintain these by hand and update all these different tools, you're gonna have drifts um, and disparity between the different environments. By being able to containerize this and self-update, self-heal the entire stack and, and always move to cattle and check out the video on cattle versus pet to really understand that, that game-changing concept. But really, the, the beauty there is to uh, orchestrate and instantiate a replica of Platform One at scale across all these different fabrics and all these different environments. And that's really a massive enabler for teams to uh, to be able to adopt DevSecOps across all these classification levels. So I, I don't think you, you would be able to achieve that kind of velocity without, without full automation, GitOps, and infrastructure as code, configuration as code, and policy as code. So we, we cover all these different uh, pieces of the puzzle in dedicated segments in this course as well. So now let's take a look at the enterprise services we, we built. We kind of designed Platform One to be uh, kind of a startup within the department. As an enterprise service provider, you want to think of the DoD programs as your customers, right? So you, so you want to make sure people are excited to be using those enterprise services. And so we designed it to be uh, very flexible and have different options. Um, we created a few uh, free services with Rapel One and Iron Bank, and then we had pay-per-use services so we can effectively scale and fund the enterprise service so we can uh, make sure that we are sustainable across the, the enterprise. So uh, Rapel One is a source code repo where we put all the 
uh, code of platform one and we open source this to uh, to the world so that's the largest contribution uh, from a government standpoint about 80 million uh, a year of taxpayer money being uh, invested in in the open source uh, capability of, of DevSecOps of Platform One. So it's it's helping a lot of companies and NATO partners and even uh, organizations outside of DoD uh, to embrace and move to DevSecOps. So check it out on repo1.dso.mil because you're gonna be able to find the entire code to instantiate a replica of Platform One and see exactly how we architect the, the stack and the software. The other piece of that is Iron Bank. We talked about the hardening and the uh, 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 partnerships we have with companies to be able to ingest their containers, harden them, sign them, and make sure they're passing and meeting the duty requirements and addressing some of the CVEs we often find. We ended up fixing of, uh, about 7,500 CVEs in a couple of years uh, by doing this with companies and open source projects. We have about a thousand containers, both open source and commercial products. Uh, that's a game changer, not just for, for the, the Department of Defense, but also for industry, because like I said, uh, it's open source and anyone can go and uh, get access to those containers as well. So those were the, the free services. Now let's take a look at the paid services that we created to be able to scale and grow and make sure we can sustain and support all these engagements across hundreds of teams across the Department of Defense with now what is pretty much a 300 people team that we funded through uh, those kind of engagements. So Big Bang is the Platform One DevSecOps platform. The, the, the really it's the essence of DevSecOps for Platform One. It's fully automated, push button deployable using GitOps and the ability to instantiate a replica of Platform One anywhere from a jet to a bomber, to a ship, to a space system, to a cloud. Uh, and, and so it's designed to be able to run anywhere. It's completely automated. Uh, it's push button deployment. And effectively anyone can take it and deploy it on their enclave and have a full replica of a, of a DevSecOps platform uh, meeting the duty requirements to be able to accelerate their adoption of, of DevSecOps. Once you have that, you can also decide to use the Polybus version, which is effectively an instantiation of Big Bang managed by Platform One as a service. So now teams at Platform One are orchestrating and managing and supporting that enclave. And so as a, as a development team, uh, usually smaller, medium-sized teams would do that and go and pay uh, Platform One to use Polybus per developer per month and get access to an already accredited stack that's already running and ready to go. And so it's, uh, it's a SaaS version of Big Bang, effectively. Another service we created that is really game-changing and was the largest implementation of Zero Trust uh, pretty much in the U.S. government, what you're looking at is the Cloud Native Access Point. And the Cloud Native Access Point is effectively enabling teams to access not only the cloud, but also uh, DoD enclaves without having to VPN into the network, Re really using what we call a, a software defined a parameter, SDP, to be able to enforce the device state, the user identity, and based on the component risk of the user identity and the role of that user and what they're supposed to have access to, and the device risk, whether it's patched, updated, and running an endpoint protection solution, and based on the component risk of the two, we whitelist access to resources. So they only get to see what they're supposed to have access to based on the risk of their devices and their role in the organization. So we really prevent the ability to laterally move to the crown jewel they're not supposed to even, even able to see. So that's a really uh, streamlined process to uh, implement zero trust down to the container level across clouds, across on-premise environment. And we have a, a full architecture document on the software that they have the mail website so you can check out exactly how we deployed and architected the uh, identity management side of the house the zero trust enforcement uh, policy enforcement side of the house and ingress egress and east west traffic so the the container to, to container uh, traffic as well so we really designed it to be um, agnostic to the environment and able to really be a, a, a micro segmentation uh, very precise so that you only get to see what you're supposed to see. And the beauty, of course, with the scene app is the ability to run across all classification levels and uh, be agnostic to, to that environment as well. So now when it comes to computer learning, keep in mind we have 100,000 people we have to train. So classrooms were out of the, the picture. 
we had to find a way to self-learn and give time for people to continuously learn first to catch up and then to keep up with the crazy pace of IT. So what you're going to see here is curated content. We went to uh, different organizations and pulled uh, to create an unbiased content that's not pushing the secret sauce of a cloud provider or a Kubernetes distribution. And so it's very agnostic to the product and really educating people on, on the right way to do things at scale across different uh, providers. And uh, we also gave an hour a day for people to learn, but then we also, uh, you know, empowered people to go through uh, different certification. And many certifications are pretty uh, simple to get, uh, uh, you know, particularly in cybersecurity, you just read a couple of books and you can answer questions. And if you're lucky enough to get more than 70%, you can get that, that certification. It's pretty much worthless because there is no ability to really demonstrate you have the skills. Uh, you just manage to answer the question, whether by luck or just by just learning by heart the answers. So that's really not a good indication of, of someone's expertise. In this case, we went to the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and looked at their existing uh, certification. And they have really three that are pretty game changing with first the certified uh, Kubernetes application developer, and then the uh, the Kubernetes security specialist, and then the, the, the Kubernetes administrator certification, which, which are really hands-on and you have to pass, you know, several hands-on exercises. So you can't cheat your way in just by being lucky. And, and then we also went and, and partnered with T-Tray to be able to use the certified East Two administrator when it comes to the service mesh. So really these certifications give you a pretty good insight when it comes to the ability of people to, to get things done. So now if you want to learn more, of course, you can check some of these links here. First, of course, we have the In the Nick of Time show, as you know, uh, In the Nick of Time TV to register and get notification on the next uh, videos and, and also the next uh, uh, live events, the YouTube channel, uh, learnwithnick.com. But also um, we created content on the software that they have the mail website under two sections. One is the DSOP slash document section where you're going to find architecture documents, videos and and a lot of information and insight as far as how we um, design Platform One to scale across the largest organization of the world, that is the DoD. And if you look at also the other side, which is the training side on slash training on software that have that mail, you're going to see a created YouTube playlist with starter, uh, intermediary, and, and advanced classes. Um, and then, of course, if you want to check out the source code of what we created, you can check Repo One on Repo One, the DSO that mail. You can check Iron Bank on ironbank.dso.mail. And so check that out as well. You're going to be able to see exactly uh, how we did all this uh, tremendous work thanks to uh, about 300 people helping us on a daily basis to, to do this in DoD. There you have it. This is your DoD case study on how we were able to build the largest implementation of DevSecOps on the largest organization in the world with the most silos and the most complex mission uh, with weapon systems at scale across hundreds of teams. So I hope this was helpful for you to demonstrate to you, your leadership and to yourself that if we can do it, so can you, whether you're in banking, healthcare, or other government agencies, it is completely doable. It's just a matter of having access to the right training, the right culture, the right technology. And with this course, we're hopeful that you're going to get all of this on a silver platter. Thanks so much for watching.